Uh, the war that has returned home where it, it belongs, it's been here more than any other in any other college in our system, is the outstanding number one teacher in Florida um, each year at our annual convention. Uh, Dr. Jerry Johnston brought the house down uh, at the annual convention, and I'm asked Jerry to give a sample, not the full uh, lecture, but to give a sample so you will be equally inspired as the judges were that awarded him. Would you uh, congratulate Dr. Jerry Johnson? Thank you, Pat. Thanks for being here. Have a good day. Well, um, hopefully your expectations aren't too high. <laughs> it's hard to live up to that sometimes. Um, well, I guess uh, here we are at convocation, and um, I guess welcome back to school for all of us. Uh, hopefully we're all back here with energy, we're all fired up, ready to go and attack the semester. Um, we all hopefully have a vision of how our semester is going to go. But one of the things we really need to make sure that we do is we have our visions grounded in reality. We are where the rubber meets the road, right? We've got reality that we deal with. And one of those realities, quite honestly, is that students are not always interested in everything we say. You know what I'm saying? Uh, even though we think that everything we say is important and brilliant and interesting, students don't necessarily see it the same way. So we essentially have a challenge. But this challenge, like all challenges in life, is actually an opportunity. And for us, it's an opportunity to do our thing, right? It's a chance to get up there, breathe life into a topic, illustrate its relevance, have fun, and maybe even inspire along the way. In other words, teach. I teach biology, and one of the topics that's commonly perceived as a little bit not so interesting or maybe even boring initially is plant ecology. Um, sorry, Craig, but... Uh, apparently, um, the general consensus is that plants are not as interesting as animals for whatever reason. Well, here's the deal. Um, my, uh, student, or my, my teaching demonstration is actually a tiny little segment of a general biology class in which we learn about plants. And hopefully this will not be boring. That's the goal. So here we go. Let's start with something that's nice and visual, wake you guys up, and it's uh, really easy. Who can tell me what the heck this thing is up on the screen? Yeah, it's an orange, right? Good job. Um, <laughs> Kind of, you know, get a layup to get things started. Now, how many of you guys have had your orange juice today? Wow, that's kind of embarrassing, right? <laughs> okay, so um, let's say tomorrow we'll have a little bit more orange juice in our diet, right? Well, how about this? What kind of fruit is that? Yeah, these are blueberries. I don't know about you. I'm not even going to ask you guys. This is what I think. Just association, blueberry, blueberry pie, blueberry pie, summertime. This is what's at the end of the spring semester, in my mind. This is what I'm working towards, getting to the blueberry pie, right? Now, this fruit right here, this is a fruit that's not nearly as popular as oranges or blueberries, but it's, it's a fruit that, that grows around here. And I know somebody, hopefully in here, knows what they are. Who could tell me what this fruit is? Yeah, that's a persimmon, right? Oop. Um, now, persimmons, now these are also fruits that are edible as long as they're ripe, right? If they're ripe, you can actually eat a raw persimmon. If you eat one, if you try to eat one that's not ripe, it's a horrible experience. They're awful. But when ripe, they're also edible. Um, you can use these persimmons to make other foods like jams and puddings and cookies. At the conference, I made cookies and passed them around, but you guys, are, there's too many people to make cookies. Uh, take my word for it, you can eat persimmons. Now, there's a reason why I'm harping on this food theme, and it's a very, very basic point that I want to establish, and it's this. We tend to look at fruit in a very selfish way. You can't get much more selfish than, I see you, I eat you, <laughs> right? That's very selfish. Well, if we really want to understand fruit, well, what we need to do is completely change our perspective and think from the point of view of a plant that produces fruit. 
If we think from that point of view, everything just makes sense. You can just logic your way through it. So let's just look at the, uh, the image up on the screen right here. This persimmon, think about, you've got a persimmon plant, and what's the deal here, right? Well, when I look at this, I see a plant that is, well, for some reason, it's taking a whole lot of its energy, and it's using that to make tasty treats and dangle them from its branches. Well, that doesn't seem very um, smart, right? If I'm a plant, it's not very logical. It seems downright wasteful. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense yet. Now, it gets even more nonsensical when you think about what a fruit looks like when you open up one of these persimmon fruits. Inside, you're going to find seeds, just like with all fruits. Now, as we learned, hopefully, last class, you know, there was a previous class, um, a seed is basically a tiny little package, right? It's a little package that has three basic things. You've got a little baby plant inside. You've got its starting food supply so it can get started. And then there's an outer layer that's protective. We call that the seed coat. Well, let's put that together. We seem to be looking at the world's worst parent. What kind of a parent would actually package their kids in a tasty treat and then <laughs> dangle them for the inevitable? Something like a raccoon's going to come along and eat them. Right? If this were the end of the story, it would make no sense whatsoever. Fruit wouldn't make sense. And we would be looking at these trees like they're horrible parents. Fortunately, there's more to the story. Um, and the, the more to the story is, is actually really simple. Just think about that raccoon, right? Focus in on that raccoon, and when that raccoon eats the fruit, it's going to eat seeds as well. So it's going to swallow those seeds. If we follow that raccoon and say sometime tomorrow when it's maybe a half a mile away in another part of the woods, what's one of the things on the list of things to do for that raccoon? <laughs> who, who wants to say it? Right? <laughs> I was hoping for resonating. Uh, that raccoon is going to poop. And in that poop, you guys tell me what's going to be in that poop? The seeds. In other words, the kids. It's going to be pooping out kids. <laughs> right? So now let's think about things. That poop event was wonderful. It's a wonderful event for everyone involved. Obviously, the raccoon gets that necessary relief. But the plant, the parent, as well as its kids also benefit. And if we think about these kids and their benefits, there are three things that we can specifically think about. One is, well, when, these, um, when the raccoon poops, these seeds are essentially going to be placed someplace away from where that parent plant was. So when that little plant, when the little plants begin to grow, they're not going to have to compete with the parent for access to sunlight or access to nutrients. So you're not competing with mom or dad, right? That's a good thing. Number two, when those little baby plants send out their first roots, well, hopefully there's a little extra dose of fertilizer from the other contents of that poop, right? Another little extra boost. The third benefit, which is the one that I like the most, really cool, it has to do with the seed coat, that outer protective layer of the, of the, um, of the seed. In the case of persimmons, the seed coat is very thick so that the little baby plants, well, some of them can't push out of that seed. They're actually trapped inside of that seed. It's kind of a horrifying thought, right? Little baby's kind of like stuck inside, can't bust out. Well, what's neat is when the seed passes through the digestive system of the raccoon, that seed coat gets partially digested and it gets thinner so that a seed that ends up with Right? So a seed that ends up in poop, basically, that's a seed that's going to grow. The little kid can bust out. So we've got a success story here. So now, when we put the, the last part of the story here, you guys tell me, is this persimmon plant a good parent or a bad parent? It's a good parent. It's just a, a parent that um, needs a little help, right? Needs a little help. The raccoon provides that extra help. So you got a neat little relationship. But the bottom line is we've gotten kids positioned in a situation where they've got a better chance at life.
And that's the ultimate goal if you're a parent. All right, that's pretty cool. Now, the story does not end here. I've got a twist. And the twist actually involves this. That is a Florida snapping turtle. They're awesome. Well, as it turns out, raccoons are not the only animals that help these persimmon plants with their parenting. Snapping turtles do the same thing. In other words, snapping turtles eat persimmons, they eat the fruits, they poop out the seeds, those seeds grow into little baby plants. That's awesome. That's also something you will not read in any textbook and you won't read anywhere yet because this is something that was recently discovered. And the person who discovered it is this guy right here. His name is Eric Suarez. And I, get, I literally get goosebumps. I'm that much of a dork. I get goosebumps when I think about this. Eric was a student who was sitting in my general biology class three years ago, listening to this same talk about poop and seeds and variations on the story, right? Well, Eric was so excited about just biology that he joined my, um, my team of students who studies um, turtles out on the Santa Fe River. I've got this, this team, we catch turtles and do all that kind of stuff. Well, one day, um, about this time last year actually, back in, uh, in December, Eric and I caught a bunch of snapping turtles. And before we got a chance to measure the snapping turtles and weigh them, just do the standard workup, a bunch of the snapping turtles pooped, pooped, right? Um, and what was neat is you know, each of these snapping turtles is in a separate little bin, right? Kind of waiting, pro awaiting processing. And Eric saw the poop and I was watching Eric, right? I'm always watching to see what these guys do. And I was so darn proud. As soon as Eric saw the poop, guess what he did? He picked it up. <laughs> and not only did he pick it up, he sorted through it. Because he wanted to find out what this turtle was eating, right? You get a lot of information from poop. <laughs> um, but basically he was sorting through the poop and I'm all proud as can be just watching. Then he noticed something. He noticed that there were seeds Lots of them, big old persimmon seeds. They're very distinctive. And I still remember this moment. Eric looked up at me and he smiled. I smiled back, no words were spoken. He knew exactly what to do and I just watched. He collected those seeds, he brought them back to school. He put them in plastic pots and he wanted to see if those seeds would grow. Well, he waited a little while four months to be exact, but first week, of October, or first, week, uh, first week of April, we got little persimmon plants. These little seedlings started to pop up. And over the next several weeks, we ended up with 38 little seedlings. That's pretty cool. Now, what these seedlings basically say, what they mean is that Eric, right, this student who was in my general biology class a few years ago, revealed a relationship between snapping turtles and persimmon plants that nobody knew or even suspected to occur. I think that's neat, and I would go so far as to say that's a pretty good learning outcome. And just to wrap things up with this thought, none of this would have been possible if Eric hadn't learned about plants in a general biology class, and then gone outside and played with poop, turtle poop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>